rush hour. John F. Kennedy International Airport. One of the busiest in the world. More than 1,200 planes use JFK every day. In the sky, they're stacked up for kilometers, waiting to land. On the ground, dozens more are waiting to take off. The constant stream of airliners can tax the abilities of even the most experienced controllers. The picture, as it's called, that they have to maintain in their head of everything they're controlling, where everybody is, their speed, their altitude, their separation, also includes constant back and forth talking to the pilots. And, and this is a matrix of information flow in and out of their brains. It's just amazing to watch. For the team of air traffic controllers in JFK's tower, it's just another day at work. It's a job that gets more demanding with each passing year. On a busy day in most centers and most departure and arrival controllers, you're saturated. You've got people talking as fast as they can. And that's where errors come in. Over the last decade, there's been a 25% jump in traffic at JFK. And New York's not alone. It's a trend that concerns some industry experts. One of the things that I do as an aviation analyst is try to keep a good lock on what's happening, watch where the weak spots are in the system. If there is another major airline accident, God forbid, it's going to probably originate from an air traffic control problem. The solution to the looming crisis is being developed here, the William J. Hughes Technical Center in New Jersey. It's the workshop of America's Federal Aviation Administration. The center has been involved in every major advance in air transportation system technology since 1958. Airport design, aircraft safety and security, communications, navigation. Scientists at the William Hughes Center have tackled aviation's most difficult problems. Today, this plane is at the heart of one of the largest projects in the history of the FAA. They're using it to design a new air traffic system that will help manage more traffic safely. A two or three-fold increase in the number of aircraft flying is certainly within the, uh, within the range of possibility in the next couple of decades. Together, test pilots and researchers need to figure out a safer way to get airplanes into and out of America's airports. What they've come up with is a system called NextGen. NextGen will supply pilots with the tools and information they need to make many decisions that are now made by controllers. At its heart is a sophisticated piece of equipment that will soon be added not to towers, but to planes. To see if it works, test pilots have to take it for a ride. We're liberating the airplane to do what it's designed to do and not constraining it by our management. Pause and break here up. Air Researchers have installed a revolutionary navigational computer in the back of this executive jet. We're currently flying over Delaware. It's called ADSB. It stands for Automatic Dependent Surveillance Broadcast. It's a sophisticated GPS receiver that paints a detailed picture of any plane anywhere near this flight. So the pilot has what we call situational awareness of what's flying around him. Uh, the aircraft then broadcasts that position once a second. So any other aircraft flying within RF range of that, that aircraft now knows its position as well. There's nothing like this in any cockpit today. Because it's still experimental technology, the FAA is testing this system in the cabin of the aircraft. If tests like this succeed, it will someday be in the cockpit of every plane in America and eventually around the world. Once the ADSB system is fully operational, everyone will know where you are, how high you're flying, and where you're headed. It's a key piece of the future because it is so accurate. The computer the researchers are putting to the test today is the central element in the most significant retooling of the American air traffic control system in half a century. 
Human beings cannot be perfect on a sustained basis. We can for certain periods of time. Therefore, we have to expect failure. People make mistakes. It's a lesson the airline industry has learned the hard way. A lesson that fundamentally shaped how planes travel across the skies today. In the few years in which they have been operating, the airlines have discovered that their efforts to improve comforts and services have... After the Second World War, Americans were traveling by air in booming numbers. The earliest air traffic controllers stood next to runways. They waved flags to guide planes in. As traffic increased, pilots also began to use radios to stay in touch with airports. The first air traffic control towers were built as more and more flights had to be handled. Airports had become very busy places, and air traffic was beginning to overwhelm controllers. June the 30th, 1956, Los Angeles International Airport. TWA Flight 2 lifts off eastbound for Kansas City. Airline flying in the 50s was, uh, was really amazing. It, it, was, it was something you dressed up for. Only people who could afford a fairly high price could actually fly. The TWA flight is a Lockheed Super Constellation, one of the most advanced commercial airliners of its time. You won't find any pilot who doesn't think the Super Connie is one of the sexiest airplanes ever designed. Just minutes behind TWA Flight 2, United Airlines Flight 718 takes off from the same airport on its way to Chicago. The system to track both of the planes is far from high tech. The air traffic control center consisted of a room with a map spread out on a table, and the air traffic controllers were moving markers on that map to indicate where each airplane was in its last known position. The pilots radio their position to company dispatchers. Controllers use this information to get a rough idea of their flight paths. They were on radar for a while in Los Angeles, but once they got outside that area, there was no radar. Uh, they were flying under visual flight rules. Uh, the rule is called see and be seen. So I see you, you see me, we stay apart, and we're responsible for our own separation and except for a few radars in certain parts of the country. Controllers didn't really know where the airplanes were. They were estimating on their reports. As the two planes get closer to the Grand Canyon, the distance between them disappears. Both captains were used to showing the canyon off on a clear day. They could move the airplane to the left, move it to the right a little bit, point out the canyon to people and get them to ooh and off. The United flight closes in on the TWA plane from the right unaware their paths are about to cross. People on one side of the DC-7 would have been able to see the oncoming constellation. Could have seen an airplane against an azure sky with fluffy clouds coming closer and closer, and they would have felt the impact. The Grand Canyon is a graveyard for 128 passengers and crew of two airliners which crashed on peaks little more than a mile apart. None survived. It was the worst commercial air disaster in history. The Grand Canyon crash created huge banner headlines across the nation and a lot of pressure on the government to do something. We needed radar. We needed to buy it and get it deployed throughout the United States immediately. We had to change the system, and we had to do it fast. The crash killed 128 people and changed the world of air traffic control forever. Following a lengthy investigation, the stark conclusion was that the crash happened because the two planes were outside of so-called controlled airspace. TWA and United collided over the Grand Canyon primarily because neither they nor the control system had the ability to know where both of those airplanes really were. Once the planes left the small area being monitored by controllers, no one was paying attention to where they were. 
The see and avoid principle is a fraud and it always has been. The fact is, the faster you go, it's a big sky, you've only got 180 degrees of peripheral vision and you can't see and avoid everything up there. In the wake of the Grand Canyon accident, American airspace was blanketed by radar. Planes were more stringently confined to air corridors, highways in the sky. The air traffic control system we have in the United States today was designed with the Grand Canyon accident in mind. That crash determined how far apart airplanes should be spaced and where radar dishes and air traffic control centers should be built. It also resulted in the formation of the Federal Aviation Administration, the FAA. But now, 50 years later, the system needs to change again. Today, the system falls short of the public's expectations, being congested, slow, clunky, unpleasant. As planes fly faster and higher, it becomes harder for controllers to track their movements. I think in many respects we're in a, a, a very similar situation to where we were in the 50s. The system has to change massively. And the change must happen soon, before we are faced with a major air accident that could take the lives of hundreds of people. The technology on board the FAA flight might be the solution to the overtaxed air traffic control system. Test pilots regularly take to the skies to help researchers prepare the new system for America's airliners. The beautiful thing about ADS-B is, is it gives the pilots in the cockpit and the air traffic controllers basically the same picture. ADS-B is more than a map of other planes. The idea is to show pilots what now only air traffic controllers can see data about the planes that are in a pilot's airspace. With ADS-B, you'll see who that other aircraft is. You'll see an identifier on it. You'll be able to see planes on runways. You'll see planes in the traffic pattern. And they'll get a better feel for what's going on around you, especially if you're on an uncontrolled airport. We can also see uh, map information. We can see navigational aids. We can also see other airports. Giving pilots all that information in the cockpit will allow them to make decisions about how to get to their destinations quickly and safely. The current system relies on radars for the detection and tracking of aircraft. And radar was a great technology in 1940, but fundamentally it's very sloppy. Today, ground-based radar bounces radio signals off an airplane to calculate its position. It can be off by as much as two miles. That's why we keep aircraft three miles or more apart, because we're just not that confident of the, of the solution. With NextGen, an onboard GPS unit will constantly receive signals from a GPS satellite. This will tell pilots where they are, down to within a few hundred feet. With a more accurate picture of airspace, airliners will be able to fly closer together. The FAA hopes this will help relieve the congestion at busy airports. Today, only controllers have an accurate picture of air traffic. They use this information to guide pilots around potential problems. The pilots themselves have no way to independently confirm where they are in relation to all other flights. They must rely on controllers to tell them. The weakness of the system was exposed years before next-gen tests began. Labor Day weekend, 1986. Ten o'clock. Approach controller Walter White guides Aero Mexico Flight 498 in for a landing at Los Angeles International Airport. The airspace around LAX is very tightly controlled. It's called the TCA, the Terminal Control Area. As Aero Mexico Flight 498 closes in on the airport, 
Walter White sees a plane he does not expect on his radar. Uh, one approach on a flight from Fullerton. Cruising altitude is 4,500. We'd like to follow. OK, you are right in the middle of the TCA, sir. Roman 66 Romeo, I suggest in future you look at your TCA chart. There was an aircraft that was east of the airport, which he became involved in. That was what they called a violator. In many cases, the air traffic that was crawling across his screen, even with transponders, were not reporting altitudes. Walter White hustles the small plane out of the controlled airspace. You just had an aircraft pass right off your left above you at 5,000. And we run a lot of jets right through there at 3,500. But White doesn't realize that there's another plane dangerously off course. We should be able to see the ocean by now. Take a look at the map and, and look around the four or five. A Piper Cherokee is cutting across the approach to LAX, oblivious to the danger. The Aero Mexico flight is just minutes from landing. Aero Mexico 498. Los Angeles approach. This can't be. The jet plunges towards Cerritos, a suburban community of Los Angeles. Aero Mexico 498, Los Angeles approach. I'm sitting there talking with the two departure controllers and uh, not really thinking. I hear Walter say something like, I think I lost one. Aero Mexico 498, Los Angeles approach. That immediately got everybody's attention. So we looked at the radars and could hear him calling Air Mexico 498. The crash devastates the community of Cerritos. 15 people on the ground are killed in the disaster, along with all 64 people on the Aero Mexico jet. The Piper Cherokee is found in a nearby schoolyard. All three people on the small plane have been killed. The fact of the matter is that the Cherokee flew into the TCA and hit the DC-9 in restricted airspace without a clearance. The National Transportation Safety Board questions Walter White about what he saw on his radar display. At any time, did you see the Piper Cherokee on your scope? No. No, sir. The Piper's target was not displayed. It is my belief that it was not on my radar scope. He uh, was positive that the aircraft was not there for him to see. But when investigators finally get the air traffic control radar records, they conclude the Piper should have been visible. We were able to determine that the aircraft that collided with Aero Mexico was there to be seen. Controllers have been complaining about the radars for a long time. We had reported problems with the radar uh, not picking up targets several times. You may lose one target. You may lose two targets. It may not be presented for one sweep. Did you see the Piper Cherokee on your scope? No, sir. But that doesn't mean that the target isn't there. A blind spot is only an instantaneous Thing. It's not a continuous thing. He was looking at one and trying to keep it clear. Lost track of another one that just happened to be at the same altitude as the approaching Aeromexico jet. It was a one in a billion chance, but that one in a billion came up that particular day. The collision over Los Angeles drew attention to weaknesses in the radar systems used by air traffic controllers and led to some much needed improvements. Mode C Intruder is an automated program that is now incorporated in all our major radar facilities that if an aircraft should inadvertently intrude, the controller will now be given a visual and an oral alert, thus giving him time to provide a timely warning to the pilot. After the collision over Los Angeles, radar systems at the airport were upgraded. The next generation of air traffic management will only use radar if the GPS system fails. 
NextGen is also targeting another weakness in the current system, the radio. Today, pilots and controllers use radios to talk to one another. We're now descending to 190 and expecting... The system depends on clear, precise language. Misunderstandings are common, and they've caused some of the most tragic air disasters in history. As the FAA test flight flies high, west of Atlantic City, its radio keeps the pilots in touch with controllers. Vector for sequence for the downwind for runway 22. Okay, 100, uh, clear for the ILS. Uh, but in the air traffic system of the future, pilots and controllers will communicate less frequently. Uh, the controller and the pilot can now work together to resolve issues instead of wasting a lot of time explaining what the issues are. Mistakes can be made for a number of reasons. English is the international language of aviation, but pronunciation, accent, and emotion alter the way any language is spoken. Nowhere is this better understood than in the air traffic control tower at John F. Kennedy International Airport. If you listen on any uh, control frequency, you're going to hear a lot of people say, would you say that again? Say again, over, please. The airspace above JFK is frequented by one of the most international collections of pilots in the world. Maintaining clear radio communications can prove challenging to controllers here. There's pressure because that's the business they're in. The, the business is moving passengers from A to B. That's what the airlines are paid, and the controllers are paid to help that work. When pressure mounts, small misunderstandings can have enormous consequences. January the 25th, 1990. In the skies over New York. I am Yacht 05. To expect for the clearance time? In 20 minutes. I think we need priority. We are passing out of fuel. Avianca 052, Roger. Um, how long can you... Avianca Flight 52 is trying to land in New York. But a driving rain is delaying air traffic into and out of the area. The flight began in Colombia. On its way to New York, it's been routed through a series of holding patterns by air traffic controllers. Bad weather is delaying landings all along the northeastern seaboard. There was a system moving through the Great Lakes, moving east. There was a couple other systems converging. And a lot of times they'll converge in the New York area there and the whole northeast will go down. It's okay if I send four more your way. Uh, casino, I'm back in the hold again. I, I got four in the stack and there's no end in sight. Uh, Avianca 052. Yeah, I might be able to get you in right now. Stand by. Thank you. They were progressively moving toward JFK and they were held in the air for three times. This certainly would put some stress on the crew uh, as to the fact they want to go from A to B. They don't want to fly in a racetrack for an hour just holding. Avianca 052, Roger. And what's your alternate? We said Boston. But uh, we can't do it now. We'd, we'll run out of fuel. The pilots are growing increasingly desperate for clearance to land. Avianca 052 only has They've flight. used up almost all of their fuel while waiting their turn. Send him up to his alternate. What is his speed now? Uh, I'm not sure, to be honest. Slow him to 180 knots, and I'll take him. After more than an hour in holding patterns, Controllers finally give the pilots of the Avianca flight permission to land. Descend and maintain 3,000. Descend and maintain 3,000. But in this critical handoff from one controller to another, no one mentions that the plane is running out of fuel. Avianca 052 Heavy, contact Kennedy Tower 119.1. Good day. It was extremely important that Avianca 52 landed on their first approach, JFK. The voice recorder revealed that the captain was certainly quite concerned about the fuel state. At JFK, only one runway is being used for landings. Weather at the airport is making approaches difficult. Avionica 052 Heavy, Kennedy Tower 22 left. You are number three following 727 traffic on a niner mile final. Avionica 052 Heavy, roger. Avionica 052, say airspeed. 145 knots. Are we clear to land, no? Yes, sir, we are clear to land. Stand by. The Avianca crew, when they felt okay, it, they the were airport. being handed off to an approach controller now and given a heading and a lower altitude. I'm sure in their minds they thought, well, they even commented on a cockpit voice recorder, we're being handled or we're being taken care of. 
four kilometers from runway 22L, and with fuel running dangerously low, the flight hits ferocious winds. They were getting like 60 knots of wind on the nose. And then as they descended on down through about 500 feet to the ground, they were down to 20 knots. So that, that's 40 knot change and 1,000 feet of elevation. That's a lot. This is the wind shear. A dramatic change of winds throws the aircraft off its descent path as it makes its approach. Glide slope. Glide slope. Glide slope. Glide slope. Runway, where is it? I don't see it. Look. I don't see it. The plane is thrown towards the ground by the winds. Look. Look. The airplane was about 200 feet above the ground, about two miles from the runway, which was well below the glide slope and very dangerous. So the, the airplane almost crashed on its first approach. Give me the landing gear up, landing gear up. When you get a missed approach, changes the whole ball game. Request another traffic pattern. Executing a missed approach, Avianca 052 Heavy. The fuel tanks aboard Avianca Flight 52 are all but empty. Another approach on the airport will be nearly impossible. Controllers in New York will have to try once more to get Avianca Flight 52 safely to the ground. That's right, to 180 on the heading, and uh, we'll try once again. We are running out of fuel. These guys were out, and they didn't say we were out. And he allowed the approach control to vector him way out in the original pattern and 15 miles north of the outer marker again. Advise him we are in an emergency. Do you tell him? Yes, sir, I already advised him. But the first officer neglects to use the word emergency in his radio transmissions to the tower. He only mentions that his fuel is low. 052 heavy contact approach on 118.4. Approach, Avianca 052 heavy. We and it was apparent from the voice recorder transcript and tape that the captain was not understanding the first officer's radio communications that were being made in English. Flame out! Flame out on engine number four! The engines quit when they're finally starved of fuel. Flame out on engine number three! Show me the runway. We just uh, lost two engines, and we need priority, please. Avianca 052. Turn left, heading 250. Intercept the local line. Without engine power, Avianca Flight 52 crashes into a residential neighborhood on Long Island. Zero five two radar contact lost. Yes, hello. I live in Cove Neck in Oyster Bay, and there is a plane crashed in our uh, yard in front of our house. Eighty-five of the one hundred and fifty-eight people on board survived the crash. Throughout the night, rescue workers pull them from the wreckage. Investigators from the National Transportation Safety Board arrive within hours. They remove the cockpit voice recorder from the wreckage. The condition of the aircraft was really astonishing to see that that much of the structure was left in the condition that it was in. It hit right on a, about a 28 degree embankment and with the wings and all the other trees, it only slid 28 feet, so it hit and stopped uh, instantly. The NTSB investigation reveals that controllers didn't transmit vital information to one another. Radio communication, one of the most vital parts of air traffic control, failed the passengers and crew. Trying to avoid those kinds of mistakes is a key component of next-gen. Radio communication will largely be replaced by an exchange of electronic data. 
automation is extremely important and in the future it's going to be able to get rid of the type of errors that occur when you put massive pressure on a human being to be 100 percent perfect with the elimination of radio chatter air traffic control towers of the future will be very quiet places controllers on the ground will still be needed to move planes in and out of airports but with more accurate information at their disposal and less need to talk to pilots they'll be able to handle far more flights than they do today 040. on board the FAA's flight the new GPS-based technology gets the ultimate test. Without any warning from air traffic control. Do you see him, Dan? No, I don't see him yet. There he is. Oh, there he is. They notice another plane, just 400 feet below. In the back of the jet, the next-gen system detects the other plane. Had the system been in the cockpit, it would have shown the pilots its precise location. Without it, they rely on a piece of technology called TCAS to warn them of the danger. Using signals transmitted from plane to plane, the traffic collision avoidance system warns pilots when other planes are too close. Uh, TCAS gives the pilot a traffic advisory at 45 seconds before the potential collision, and then at approximately 25 seconds or so before the potential collision, a resolution advisory is given to actually tell the pilots to climb or descend to avoid the altitude of the other aircraft. And normally air traffic will call that to us, but yeah, they didn't yeah. even call the traffic, no. so that TCAS helped a lot. TCAS can help pilots of approaching planes avoid collisions. But with the new system, pilots will be able to prevent their planes from getting dangerously close in the first place. You know, with ADS-B, we're going to be able to see that traffic on the display. So the avionics can have smarts built into it to warn the pilot when he's approaching another aircraft. Today, the system works perfectly. The pilots of the test flight see the danger and avoid it. TCAS can help pilots avoid a collision. But having it on board is no guarantee that an accident won't happen. September the 29th, 2006. A small business jet flies high above the Brazilian countryside. The pilots will fly to Manaus in Brazil before taking off again for New York City. Brasilia, November. In the cockpit, co-pilot Jan Palladino is having trouble maintaining radio contact with air traffic controllers. He tries different channels but still no one responds to his radio calls. Brasilia, November 6, 00. It's unusual for pilots and air traffic controllers to be out of contact for such an extended period of time. Brasilia, November 6, 00, X-ray, Lima. November 6, 00, X-ray. Finally, after 12 attempts, Palladino gets through to controllers. No, set. Contact, one, two, three, one, two, six, small, four. Five. Sorry, say frequency one more time for November 6, 00, X-ray Lima. But Palladino can't understand the garbled radio transmission. Brasilia, November 6, 00, X-ray Lima. Then the signal disappears altogether. The jet follows the Brasilia Air Corridor en route to Manaus. But traffic along this corridor runs in both directions. The airway system between Brasilia and Manaus is very simple. It makes airplanes fly northbound, maintaining even levels, and airplanes flying southbound, maintaining odd levels. A little more than two hours into the flight, disaster strikes. The concussion itself seemed to affect every atom in my body. The end of the wing was chopped off and it was serrated. It looked like it had been chewed off. The legacy jet has struck an oncoming Boeing 737. Goal flight 1907. With 154 people on board, the goal flight spirals out of control. The pilots of the smaller jet don't know what they've hit. 
but their business jet is still flyable. Sit down back there. I got it, I got it, I got it. Just let me fly the thing, dude. All right? We're descending, I want to get down. Okay, it's yours, it's yours. The crew locates a runway at a military base in the middle of the jungle. November 600 X-ray Lima declaring an emergency. We need to land at Sierra Bravo Charlie Charlie. Is that your airport? Affirmative. The pilots of the executive jet attempt an emergency landing. Okay. Here we go. Hold it. Let's dump the flaps at the top of the flare, right? So give me nine flare, on right? the flare. So you give me nine. Yeah, you, we got, nine. Flare, you yeah. got nine. Everyone sit down back there. When you land under those sort of circumstances, you're landing faster than you normally would. You're coming down like gangbusters. Good. You got it. Hold it. You're good. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> good job. Oh, man. <laughs> At Brasilia Air Traffic Center, Controllers have lost track of goal flight 1907. Manaus, there isn't any goal. I can't see anything here. It's on its way. So it's already in my area? For over half an hour. Anxiety was high, and controllers were confused about what to say. They didn't know what was happening. Troops locate the wreckage of goal flight 1907 deep in the Amazon jungle. There are no survivors. Investigators learn that the legacy jet and the Gulf flight were flying along the same air corridor in opposite directions. 1,000 feet of altitude is supposed to separate them. Investigators interview the pilots of the business jet. We are proceeding northwest on course to Manaus at 37,000 feet. OK, we are attempting to contact Brazilian control. Did you say you were flying at 37,000 feet? Yes, that's right. Flight level 370. We never moved from that. The pilots of the executive jet filed a flight plan in which they would fly at 37,000 feet until they reached Brasilia. There, they would descend to 36,000. The flight plan calls for you to descend to 360 at Brasilia. Why didn't you? We weren't told to. Before we took off, we were cleared for 370 all the way to Manaus. That's what we did, sir. Uh, I don't know Air traffic control can always deviate from the flight plan because they have best knowledge of the actual traffic situation. We were not told to descend, and we did not descend. Once we knew for sure that both planes were flying at the same altitude, we knew there would be a lot to investigate on the side of air traffic control. Can you call up the legacy jet screen for me? On the radar screen, we see the altitude, the speed, and the transponder information of each plane. Images show investigators what air traffic controllers saw on their radar screen before the accident. One symbol stands out. The set on the air traffic controller screens indicates that the airplane he's looking at has lost its transponder. Roger. Transponders give controllers exact information on the altitude of the flights they monitor. Investigators learned that the transponder aboard the Legacy had been turned off. Possibly due to the captain's inexperience with the new jet. Still working out the kinks on how to work this flight management. Without information coming from the jet's transponder, the air traffic computer displays the altitude the plane is supposed to be at, according to the flight plan. But it's actually flying 1,000 feet higher, right in the path of the goal flight. The Brazilian controllers did not verify the legacy jet's real altitude. Nobody did anything from the ground, which is where we expected to happen, to save these two airplanes from being head-on at the same altitude.
Back over Atlantic City, pilots are preparing to bring their test flight in for a landing. Today, the flight has to stay within tightly confined boundaries set out by air traffic controllers. But when all aircraft are equipped with ADS-B, that won't be the case. If the aircraft could fly on a path that was optimum for them and optimum for the traffic system, we could use a lot more of the airspace than we do today. We're going to have airplanes flying directly to where they need to fly and computers keeping them apart. At the FAA, researchers have been designing systems that get flights from A to B in a whole new way. Right now, there's no way for controllers to know the exact location of a plane. That's why flights are confined to preset highways to keep them from colliding. With GPS-based next-gen, a pilot can follow any route he chooses, provided there aren't any other planes in his path. He can choose a much more direct route to his destination. If we could have airplanes going in all directions and more efficiently directly to where they want to go, uh, we would be able to double, triple, maybe even quadruple the number of aircraft that we could safely handle in the skies at one time. By charting their own route, ADSB will allow pilots to keep a safe distance from other planes without having to stick to a preset highway in the sky. Maintaining that distance is important because even the best technology can't keep airplanes apart. July 2002. Bashkirian Airlines Flight 2937 cruises westbound through the night sky for Barcelona. The Tupolev 154M carries 69 people. Most of the passengers are Russian children traveling on a summer holiday. Meanwhile, a DHL cargo aircraft travels north towards Brussels. The two flights are supposed to pass each other over Lake Constance in southern Germany. Climb flight level. But air traffic controllers have failed to notice that both flights are at the same altitude. The controller is distracted by another flight. At a second station, he assists a late arrival. What is your present heading? It was a standard practice at the ATC company that at night, one air traffic controller was responsible for controlling the entire airspace of ATC Zone. Aboard the Tupolev, the pilots have spotted an intruder. Look, look at that. And it's closing in fast. 500 meters. On board the DHL cargo plane, the TCAS computer is issuing an urgent warning. Defend. The system Defend. is designed to warn pilots of an oncoming flight. Increase descent. And what to do to avoid collision. 600. TCAS descent. When the air traffic controller returns to his position, he sees the conflict. The flights will cross paths in less than a minute. Descend flight level 350. Expedite, I have crossing traffic. The Russian captain obeys the controller's instruction to descend. But his TCAS system is telling him to climb. Climb. It says climb. Climb. The Russian crew has 35 seconds to decide whether to obey the air traffic controller descend or the computer. Descend level 350. Climb. Climb. Descend level 350. Expedite descent. Climb. He's guiding us down. We're not accustomed to not trusting controllers. In civil aviation, there were lots of situations when pilots didn't follow instructions of the controller. And that led to plane crashes or other accidents. Expedite descent level. Under pressure, with just seconds to decide, the Russian pilots follow the controller's direction. At the same time, the DHL jet is also descending. Increase descent. Increase descent. Increase! He's going below us. Increase climb. Increase climb. Where is it? Climb! 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 climb. Descend. Descend hard! 
of Bravo Tango Charlie 2937. Bravo Tango Charlie. Both flights crash near Lake Constance in Germany. 71 people are killed. There are no survivors. The collision leaves air traffic experts at a critical crossroads. If I have to summarize the advice that we gave the world, if a warning comes from ACAS, pilots should immediately follow it at all times. If the Russian pilots had followed the computer's instructions, the accident would not have happened. With the benefit of hindsight, you always ask yourself, could we have done more? And an accident is a wake-up call for everybody. The disaster highlighted the potential value of automated systems and proved again how fatal human errors can be. It's an important lesson for the developers of next-gen. Technology can provide humans with information, but can't control what they do with it. You're before landing. Over Atlantic City, the FAA jet is on its final approach. Runway is clear. Bring the flaps to uh, 16. Its two-hour test flight has brought NextGen one step closer to being installed on commercial airplanes. Nice job, guys. Two reversers. Speed's at 90. I got the yoke. When ADS-B is everywhere, and the data is being displayed in the cockpit, that will allow the airlines to fly hugely more efficiently. Over the past 50 years, air traffic control has evolved tremendously. <laughs> Human error. Technical difficulties. And poor communication have taken the lives of hundreds of people and uncovered deadly weaknesses in the current system. Today, those weaknesses are one step closer to being fixed. I think the next-gen system, as it has evolved now, is really going to be excellent. It's going to start in the direction that we need to go for the future. The elements that make up next-gen will be introduced slowly over the next decade. Piece by piece, a whole new system of air traffic control will take shape in the U.S. and ultimately around the world. That's what airplane people do. They uh, react to the challenge and develop a new way of flying. If next gen lives up to its promise, that new way will mean fewer delays and ultimately fewer accidents. Okay,